The purpose of this webinar series is to introduce coalition members and substance misuse preventionists to current and relevant research being conducted in the substance use and community coalition fields. I'm joined for this installment by Dr. Cheryl King. She will present on her and her colleagues article, Emerging Trends in Adolescent Suicide Prevention Research, which was published in Current Opinions in Psychology in 2018. And we'll discuss how coalitions can effectively incorporate adolescent suicide prevention into their substance misuse prevention work. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Cheryl King. Cheryl King is a professor in the departments of psychiatry and psychology and director of the Youth Depression and Suicide Prevention Program at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on the development of evidence-based practices for suicide risk screening, assessment, and intervention. She has provided leadership for multiple NIMH-funded projects, including emergency departments screen for teens at risk for suicide, which aims to develop a suicide risk screen that can be disseminated nation nationwide and 24-hour risk for suicide attempts in a national cohort of adolescents. A clinical psychologist, educator, and research mentor, Dr. King has served as Director of Psychology Training and Chief Psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and has twice received the Teacher of the Year Award in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. She is the lead author of Teen Suicide Risk, a Practitioner Guide to Screening, Assessment, and Management. In addition, Dr. King has provided testimony in the U.S. Senate on Youth Suicide Prevention and is a past president of the American Association of Suicidology, the Association of Psychologists and Academic Health Centers, and the Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. She's a current member of the National Advisory Mental Health Council. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. King to discuss her work. Uh, thank you, Carolina and Kadka, for the invitation to talk with you today. I was delighted to see all the hellos in the chat rooms uh, really coming in from all across the country. Um, I look forward to sharing some of where we are today with our understanding of adolescent suicide risk and just some ideas of resources. And then I look forward to our Q&A and discussion. So to get started, just with some, some numbers about the scope of the problem, uh, suicide is now the second leading cause of death among adolescents in the United States, uh, same with young adults, and males account for the majority of all the suicides. Now that's actually true across the lifespan in the United States. Many of the youth who die by suicide have absolutely no history of ever having received any mental health services. And I was just looking to update this yesterday and pulling out, some of you I'm sure are familiar that we have a national violent death reporting system now uh, where a lot more data is coming in from states than used to uh, about violent deaths. And it was still the case that only about 40% in 2017 of all the adolescents uh, who died by suicide had any record of having any kind of mental health service. Of course, this is important because it emphasizes how much we need to strive to recognize risk so we can get in there and, and prevent these tragedies. Um, a little bit on, on the prevalence. Um, it has been gradually increasing. Um, you know, unfortunately, because uh, there are many efforts at awareness about the problem. I think there's been more national visibility. There's probably now more funding than ever before to try to figure out what to do about it. But what, what you can see here is especially for our 15 to 19 year olds who have a much higher rate than 10 to 14, uh, is that in 2000, we were at just over probably eight per 100,000, and now we're about up to 12, so close to a 50% increase in the rate of suicide in the US in this last 18 years. Um, our data goes through about 2018 at this point. So uh, we'll come back to this at the end. I think we can bring this rate down again, and it's gonna take some real effort 
to, to drive it down, but I think we can do that. A little bit about, I mentioned males, they account for about three quarters of all the youth and young adult suicides. Um, but there are sociocultural influences on suicide too. And we're often working, I'm in a department of psychiatry, I work in clinics. You know, we adhere to a mental health model and view of the world regarding um, mental disorders or psychiatric disorders, psychopathology. But there are many other influences when we think of a problem like suicide. And what you can see here uh, are two things. I mean, one, if you look at for white Americans, this royal blue line, and these are data from our Centers for Disease Control, you can see how the, the steep incline, the greatest incline for many of these groups is happening during the adolescent years. We don't have a lot of suicide, it's not unheard of, but we don't have a lot of suicides before the age of 10 and certainly not before the age of six, seven. But then you have these steeper increases across the adolescent years. And for white Americans, it increases, continues to increase in middle age and is the highest among the elderly. But look at our line for American Indian um, individuals. This gray line, the peak suicide rate is actually with young people and it's not peaking among the elderly. So there are definitely differences. If I showed you a map of the United States, you would also see differences. Um, you know, the, the suicide rate in our Western and Central Plain states is much higher than it is in the Southeast. Uh, where I am in Michigan, we're relatively low, but not one of the lowest states. There are some states that have twice the suicide rate of other states. So there are a lot of influences that go beyond our mental health models. Now compare these two. This is the female suicide rate in the US. It's graphed exactly the same way. So I didn't change the scale of the figure. So to go back, there's the male scaled on the left side, uh, zero to 60 and here's the female. And the most notable thing is that it's much lower. And it's much lower across all of our demographic subgroups. Women have a lower rate of suicide and that lower rate is maintained across the lifespan. The other notable aspect when you compare the two figures is that there's not as much difference for females across these different sociographic groups defined by race and ethnicity. And what about moving from, from death by suicide to what high school students report about having thoughts of suicide, having considered making a suicide plan, having saying that in the past year, I have tried to kill myself, I've attempted suicide. Now these are anonymous surveys um, they're done on a regular basis. Representative sample of high school students from private schools and public schools. And here you see the difference where females, and I, on your screen, I'm guessing it's going to be this green or teal. They're more likely to have seriously considered suicide, to say they've made a suicide plan, and to say they made a suicide attempt. And these are all approximately double. Uh, for girls relative to boys. So one thing we, we keep in mind that many girls are uh, experiencing the emotional stress, the hopelessness, the depression, the morbidity that goes with suicidal thoughts. Um, more males are dying by suicide, even though they may not be sharing or experiencing some of these suicidal thoughts. Now, I'm, I'm gonna pull some. Um, the Centers for Disease Control uh, put this together uh, just a few years ago, uh, a new technical package where they pulled together everything we knew today. What can we do in the US? Uh, we don't have a lot of definitive evidence for exactly how to prevent suicides, but we've learned a lot about high-risk subgroups, about different strategies for recognizing 
what may be helpful in reducing attempts. And they had different categories. And I'm gonna talk with you today about two of these. And these are, how can we create more protective environments to lower risk? And then for those who are known to be at elevated risk for suicide, how can we recognize that risk and support them and intervene with them? And beginning with creating protective environments, there are three big risk factors that have more to do with the environment or as much to do with the environment as with our individual youth. One is the problem of inter interpersonal trauma and violence. Um, this is neither necessary nor sufficient for a suicide attempt or suicide to occur, but it's very commonly found in the histories of those who are suicidal and who die by suicide not always, but commonly. And different kinds of interpersonal trauma, it could have been, uh, or child maltreatment, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, you know, alcohol and drug use that uh, probably almost everyone on this um, webinar um, following it today may know more about some of this than I do, but I know it well as a risk factor for suicide attempt and suicide and that the availability of alcohol and drugs to our young people uh, can make a big difference, particularly at a time when they're, when they're vulnerable or um, experiencing strong negative emotions that they can't manage. And then reducing access to lethal means, particularly firearms in the US. So let's talk about some of the protective environments one by one. Interpersonal trauma and violence, 10 times the suicide risk. Um, and when we get to sexual abuse, the severity of the abuse uh, also relates to how much the risk is elevated. Bully victimization and perpetration in our schools is associated with risk. It's not a one-to-one -one linear relationship. It's not the cause of a suicide. But we think of suicide as being multifactorial, where different risk factors come together in different combinations in different young people. So there's no single profile of risk. And if we were to look at all the youth who come into our emergency departments or our psychiatric hospitals or our schools with suicide risk, what we'd see is a highly heterogeneous group of young people. Um, some who may be um, victims of bullying, may be dealing with depression, may be dealing with um, really being ridiculed for being different. You may have others who are, um, have a bipolar disorder and are behaviorally disinhibited, uh, using alcohol and drugs. Another young person might be mostly isolating at home with severe depressive ruminations. So different combinations of risk factors, but interpersonal trauma is an independent risk factor. So it's gonna add on. It's not only a risk in the face of others, it in itself creates a significant risk. So what do we know about what to do with interpersonal trauma and violence? There have been a lot of uh, positive parenting programs child abuse prevention programs, where parents are learning more parenting skills, um, learning maybe how to manage um, strong anger. Uh, we also have programs in the schools where children may be learning um, how to try to resist something that they shouldn't have to try to resist. We don't have strong evidence yet that they're preventing child mistreatment. That doesn't mean they don't. There's only so much research going on, but there's a lot of work in this area. And so far, I guess I'd say some positive signals that these are making a difference. Similarly, bullying prevention programs in schools have been associated with at least modest. You know, it doesn't turn it around, uh, but when a school does have a program that doesn't tolerate bullying, modest reductions have been seen. 
Now let's turn to alcohol and drug use. Uh, it definitely differentiates um, those who think about suicide from some of those who engage in suicidal behavior. Uh, we have a model we talk about now, ideation to action, a framework that there's a lot of correlates of thinking about suicide. Which of those are really important to those who, and that in itself is painful and a struggle, but what predicts who moves on to make an attempt to die by suicide. And alcohol and drug use are, are certainly two of the primary factors. Uh, again, similar to interpersonal trauma and maltreatment, they're, not, they're neither necessary nor sufficient for there to be a suicide, but they also are often involved. What can we do about these? I think you're probably all doing many things. I picked one out to share that some of you may well be familiar with or be using because um, researchers have actually showed an association with suicide risk later. And this is the Family Checkup, a school-based program developed to reduce substance use and behavior problems in adolescents. Really the focus is on strengthening parenting skills, family functioning, consulting with families. There's different levels or tiers of intervention depending on the family's need. Um, but they actually, in offering this with sixth grade students and following these students, they had reduced suicidal thoughts all the way to young adulthood. Um, and then they started another study with age two and showed an advantage at age 14 in terms of ideation. And, and this, I think, shows how sometimes uh, we go upstream and our prevention programs can be powerful. It's hard to measure in a prevention program when we prevent something from happening. It's hard to know we've done it. And, and yet, maybe some of the most powerful impacts we'll have will be with younger children and families uh, to help them get on healthier trajectories. Um, because problems tend to beget more problems. If we think of a transactional model, um, if a child is having a lot of behavioral difficulties in school and then begins maybe to have academic difficulties or difficulties socially with maintaining relationships with peers, you know, this can downward spiral in, into feeling down, then maybe into using alcohol or drugs and then into more behavioral discontrol. Um, and we see a lot of negative spirals and pathways that aren't going in the right direction when we see youth suicide risk. <coughs> Excuse me. The third one that is protective environments, reducing access to lethal means. Now in the US, we've probably done the most with trying to have um, uh, firearm safety. And um, you know, a good half of young people's suicides in the US do involve firearms. And we also have accidental firearm deaths with young children. We have homicide deaths with firearms. So one thing that we're beginning to work a great deal with in the United States is what can we do with firearm safety with families? And th this is, has nothing to do with the Second Amendment or firearm restrictions. I think we embrace our Second Amendment. It's a, really about safety in the home with the firearms being um, locked and unloaded and, and helping families to achieve that in the um, easiest and most affordable way possible. We're actually right now uh, working with the um, National Center for Maternal and Child Health on a firearm safety initiative um, up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where we've worked with the local community to help us develop an online intervention for families. Um, and it, the families, it does not take long, it's probably 30 minutes or so total, maybe a couple of hours if they wanna spend more time with their family considering their action plan. But it, it moves them through four steps and 
The first is a, a nine minute video that the community uh, developed with us that it shows um, multiple generations in the community talking about firearm safety and their experience. And then after the video, there's some fact sheets that the community developed with us that are more local in terms of the statistics and more hopeful. Um, wanna, and we've worked a lot with community input. You probably notice many fact sheets, they look almost like scare tactics about everything that can go wrong and how much has gone wrong. But it's also really helpful for people to see where making a change in behavior has changed um, the numbers, has made a difference. And then after the fact sheets, they do a, can go through an online decision aid to think about what are their options for firearm safety? What would they like to do to make a difference with the firearms in their barn or home or car? And then the final thing is just their action plan. Um, and they just move through these steps online and we're actually just, we'll be learning over the next six weeks um, if they thought this was helpful and if some of them made a change. We also, in our clinical and mental health settings, like in emergency departments, when young people come in um, with suicide risk, talking with the family about uh, maybe locking up the medications if the child made a, an overdose, you know, thinking then about their firearms. And some of these lethal means restrictions, interventions is what they're often called, uh, they have led to lasting changes where parents have developed new habits uh, for managing the risk in their homes. It isn't common um, that, that people um, do this automatically, and it's not common that we often mean restriction counseling in all of our settings. This is one of the things we probably can, can work to do more of in our healthcare settings. So that's some about the, the safe environments. Um, what can we do about access and education around alcohol and drug use? What can we do to prevent um, interpersonal violence and child maltreatment? And how can we have safer environments without um, dangerous items like firearms available to youth? Because youth sometimes get very upset. They have strong, just like all of us, they have strong negative emotions. They may not cope well. And that's not a moment when we want them to have access to something that's dangerous. So for the second E area, uh, recognizing suicide risk and responding to it. One of our primary strategies uh, the, is the Garrett Lee Smith grants coming out of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, have funded many of our states, American Indian communities, or tribal nations to um, develop strategies and training programs in their communities uh, so that gatekeepers, which really mean the adults in the community who have regular contact with the youth, that they could recognize suicide risk and be comfortable with how to respond to the risk. And these training programs um, generally will share signs of suicide risk. How do you ask about suicide risk? Um, what can you do if you recognize this in a young person? So what to say, where to go to get them help? And they have actually shown uh, across um, the sites that have been funded, which is many of them, that it has been associated with reductions in suicide deaths and attempts in those counties. So very promising. Many of our states and tribal nations have these Garrett Lee Smith uh, gatekeeper training programs going today. And I think they're important because um, for many of us, this isn't easy. Uh, you know, it, 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 we, we do need the training. We do need to become comfortable uh, both with how to recognize it and then to be comfortable responding. They more recently, just in 2019, published the follow-up studies. 
and, and show that that reduction in suicide mortality was retained for two years. And the more they continued to offer gatekeeper training, the better it was. Because there is a lot of turnover. So the gatekeepers who are trained are very often teachers. Um, it could include parents, primary care physicians, uh, first responders. You can think of any number of gatekeepers. The others in the schools, all the staff who work in the schools. What about recognizing uh, suicide risk through screening? So gatekeeper training, the idea is not proactive screening. With gatekeeper training, it's the adults. So in the school, let's say it's all the adults, counselors, principals, assistant principals, custodians, teachers, they've learned a risk and we're gonna recognize risk and we're kind of counting on them to recognize it. This is another strategy to identified risk. It's actually to screen youth very directly. It's easier said than done. For one, you've got to have a good screening instrument. Uh, sensitivity refers to, does the screening instrument capture as a positive screen everyone who's really at risk? And specificity is, um, those it captures and says are at risk, are they really at risk? Because we don't want to, um, you know, say 75% of the school screens positive and is at risk. Because if we screen them as positive, we're, we need to do something about it. We're probably contacting their parents. We may be working to line up help. So we need an instrument that reach, reaches those at risk but doesn't capture a whole bunch of additional people. We don't have the resources for it, nor do we want to create that kind of um, concern if it doesn't exist. Another challenge is just the heterogeneity of risk that I mentioned earlier. We can't necessarily just screen for suicidal thoughts. Maybe we have a male at very high risk, a teen boy, and he's not, um, he's not sharing or he's not experiencing suicidal thoughts, and yet he's at high risk. How are we going to screen for these different risk factors? Not all youth will share them. They may have been hospitalized. They didn't like the experience. They may not, um, uh, they may have an experience where when they share something personal, the adults in their lives have reacted very strongly, fallen out of their chairs, gotten upset, saying, you have a good life. What are you, you know, how can this be? And it's just, they don't want to go there. But we also have to be aware that no screen will pick up everyone at risk. And then how do we find the males at risk? Um, and can our screen do that well? So let's talk a little bit about what we know about screening. And I want to tell you about this large project we're just finishing. Um, it's called ED Stars, and it, it's been uh, it was funded to develop a new screen that might work better than what we have currently. Our first question is, could we develop a computerized adaptive screen that would actually predict who makes a suicide attempt within three months of the emergency department visit with strong specificity and sensitivity, meaning it's pretty accurate. This is what we compared it to. Some of you may be familiar with this. I do recommend it. Ask Suicide Screening Questions, ASQ. If you would like to use a brief screen that's readily available for free in the public sector, you can um, search on ASQ and come up with this and print it and use it freely. And it's just four questions. Have you wished you were dead? Have you felt your family be better off if you were? Have you had thoughts of killing yourself? And have you ever in your lifetime tried to? This additional query at the bottom, if they answer yes, this is because when we use it in the emergency department, certainly we, we intervene immediately in a different way if it's an imminent risk. So we were working to develop a screen and, and see in a comparative way how would it fare against the ASQ, which is a decent screen. Takes less than two minutes. 
And a positive screen is defined as a yes to any of those first four questions. You can see in one study, this was just with people who came in with a psychiatric complaint. So this isn't like a screen in the medical emergency department or in a school. It's people who literally came to the emergency department with a behavioral health emergency. It was pretty sensitive in picking up who was struggling. It picked up too many people. And that's one of the challenges and one of the things we were hoping to improve upon because that's a lot of resources um, uh, that our healthcare system doesn't necessarily have. And here's the link to get that tool. So a classical screen like ASQ, that just is what we're used to with most self-report screens and questionnaires, the Beck hopelessness scale, the Beck depression inventory. I'm guessing you're definitely familiar with probably the audit um, or the posit, some of these tools. They, they give everyone the same questions. So everyone gets the same and there's often a clinical cut point. And that can work pretty well for uh, unidimensional things like hopelessness. All the questions have to do with hopelessness. Now, as we said earlier, suicide risk is multifactorial. So there's many risk factors that combine in different ways. So the advantage of a computerized adaptive screen, it's actually adapting for individuals, which items and how many items. Everyone gets some of the ASQ questions about suicidal thoughts and behavior, but then subsequent questions posed to them depend on their responses to the prior questions. And just to give you, this is something that we have done uh, to develop the algorithms. Uh, we needed a very large and representative group. So we've done this work in 14 pediatric emergency departments and in um, the White River uh, Indian hospitals that primarily serves the White Mount Apache tribal nation. Screened over 6,600 youth. And let me just kind of jump to the, what's most important. There is possible, it required an average of 11 items. They do this on an iPad. It takes less than two minutes. It's pretty sensitive. Um, we didn't get up to 95 or six, or if we got that high, you lost all specificity. Uh, but if trying to find a sweet spot where you're decently sensitive, you're capturing most youth at risk, but you're not capturing too many that aren't, um, we achieve that fairly well. Now, one of the challenges going forward is this requires um, the technical software and the iPads, and hopefully it can get integrated in, at many hospitals or emergency departments into their electric, um, electronic health record at some point but the ASQ is also a good screen. That's something of what's happening in the field now with suicide risk screening. What we're hoping to recognize suicide risk is that we use a combination of gatekeeper training for adults in our communities who have regular contact with high numbers of youth so they can recognize and respond and proactive screening, if not everywhere in the healthcare system. Some people advocate for it in the schools. I have nothing against that. It's a bit more challenging. A school can't set up proactive screening for suicide risk unless they're really set up to respond to those positive screens. And that may or may not be possible in many of our schools. So we've recognized risk. And now um, what happens if many, even when they come to the emergency department, um, don't end up getting help, and many continue to be suicidal after their discharge from the hospital. Uh, just a little bit about promising psychosocial interventions. Um, there have been some good reviews. This one just came out. Uh, Cassie Glenn in 2019, she reviewed all the evidence uh, SAMHSA is a getting ready now, and I think by the end of the year, it'll be out, a guide to evidence-based treatment and intervention 
for youth at elevated risk for suicide. But as you likely have in um, you know, the field with a drug and alcohol misuse too, we, we kind of look at how strong is the evidence for these different interventions. And what I can tell you is with youth suicide risk, we have one that's well established, meaning it's been studied and found to be effective twice. And then we have a whole bunch that are possibly or probably eff efficacious. So I think this means two things. One is the more we can do to prevent that level of risk, the better. We'll save everyone a lot of pain. And the further down the trajectory someone is with severe suicide risk, actually the harder it is to change that tra trajectory. And the other is we have more work to do uh, to develop more effective interventions. The one that has been studied twice is DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Some of you are probably familiar with Marsha Linehan's work and the work of others since. Um, it does a lot with emotion regulation, with a focus on safety, with understanding behaviors and consequences. And then most of the probably, possibly efficacious treatments involve cognitive behavioral therapies, not so different than probably much of your work with alcohol and drug use. They involve a family component. They involve education and parent training. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this one because we de developed it with uh, my group at Michigan. It's a youth nominated support team uh, for suicidal adolescents. Uh, this is based on social support and health behavior intervention models. It's different in that the intervention is with adults that the youth nominate. And there's two key pieces to this intervention. One is that the adolescents are empowered to nominate up to four adults they'd like to be part of it. And they're encouraged to nominate adults they trust and feel they can talk with. They don't have to see them often. They don't have to live in town. It could have been a teacher from last year or a grandparent that lives across the country, but they're nominating them. Of course, the parents have veto power if they have a concern. The other key to it is that those adults as support people, when these teens leave the hospitalization for suicide risk, we're helping them understand what's going on with the youth. We're supporting them. We're answering their questions um, and doing what we can so they're well informed and supported and can be helpful. We did a randomized clinical trial with 448 teens who are hospitalized to suicide risk. We randomized them to either the usual treatments, usually means they leave the hospital with a combination of a recommendation for psychotherapy and medication, or the usual treatments plus this youth nominated support team. The initial effects, we followed these teens for a year, were very modest. They had a more rapid decrease in suicidal thoughts and they did get more treatment. One of the roles of the support people, it's, it's to encourage and support um, follow through with recommended treatments. But more recently, this is something I've been at a very long time, we got the National Death Index records 11 to 14 years after the youth participated. This is small for a mortality outcome study. I acknowledge we need to replicate it, but it's very promising. We had 13 deaths in the treatment as usual group and only two in the other group. If you like uh, statistical significance, this was at the 0.004. So this size difference could have only happened by chance four in a thousand times. And because it is a small mortality study, rather than look at this hazard ratio, that there were over six times as many deaths, we look at the confidence interval. And the confidence interval says that at the lowest end of confidence, we can say this 0.49 rounded to 50, 0.50, there were at least 50% fewer deaths with YST. So we are actually working now um, to try to understand this more and to begin to disseminate it 
we'll bring in more technology to make it easier for people to use. And we need to work on insurance reimbursement for the intervention specialists or the social workers who are supporting the adult support people. So it's always change in the healthcare system at some point generally wraps in with reimbursement. So driving down the number of youth suicides, uh, some of our promising strategies include creating safe environments, preventing interpersonal violence, helping parents and preventing substance misuse, engaging in means restriction and safe firearm storage, training gatekeepers and implementing suicide risk screening programs, and providing treatments that are effective uh, to those who are at risk. This is my um, um, slide I, I said I would loop back to that I think is actually a we can do it slide. This is comparing the rates of suicide death, traffic fatalities and homicides in our young people in the United States since 2000. And you can see the blue line is suicide, how it has gradually been creeping up but look at this, what we have done in our nation. I don't think this gets anywhere near enough attention. It is, um, it blows me away what we've accomplished that in the same 20 years, 18 years, because 17, the data are here are going through 2017, how we have brought down traffic fatalities among young people uh, in the US. Um, I think it's a pretty amazing public health accomplishment and really shows what we can do when we get public policy, federal funding, uh, advocacy groups, families, and young people all working on the, the same page. So let me stop there so we can go to Q&A. Thank you very much. I know this is a different venue. I can't see you and you can't see me, but uh, I know you're out there and I'm glad you're able to attend today. All right, we're gonna start the Q&A session now. So first, Kadka is gonna ask Dr. King uh, several questions, and then we're gonna turn it over to participants to ask questions. I see there's already uh, 14 questions in the Q&A box, that's great. Keep all your questions coming, and we will get to as many as you can. And the Q&A box, as a reminder, that's the icon with two speech bubbles along the bottom. So, so I'm gonna get started here. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that suicide rates are higher for males than for females, and you also mentioned the YRBS data that female adolescents are more likely than male adolescents to consider suicide, make a suicide plan, and make a suicide attempt. Could you discuss why this might be and how uh, the issue can be addressed, perhaps through community coalitions, but in general, how the issue can be addressed? Yes, as I mentioned, um, males account for about three quarter of youth and young adult suicides. Uh, we think there's probably at least um, three uh, reasons, many more likely, but primary reasons for this. One is that males are more likely to use lethal uh, methods when they make a suicide attempt. Um, High numbers of girls and boys die by firearm suicides, but girls also make many suicide attempts that don't involve a firearm. Uh, and when the firearm is chosen on the first suicide attempt, there's a very low survival rate. So some of this is the, the choice of, of methods. That may relate to a second strong possibility there is a, a leading theory of suicide now, Thomas Joyner's theory, the interpersonal psychological theory of suicide, which posits that there's three, um, three components are in place when a suicide occurs. One is a sense of thwarted belongingness, and one is perceived burdensomeness, and one is the acquired capability to kill oneself. Now, obviously there may be depression and many other factors that lead to the thwart, sense of thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness. But according to this theory, 
those are there at some point and they account for the, the suicidal desire or the suicidal thoughts. And there's some support, they may not both be necessary. A lot of people are studying this now. But where the acquired capability comes in is, but of all those who have the desire and think about it, what accounts for those who take the step to kill themselves? An acquired capability would be uh, instances of physical pain and injury in the past. According to Joyner's theory, this could include sexual trauma, physical trauma, surgeries. Um, it could include um, a history of physical fighting. Uh, it could include bullying. It could include, um, uh, could include being a surgeon. But it's the idea that there's a different pain threshold or tolerance for bodily injury. And um, if, if we look at patterns and how these divide up, um, maybe not so much by biological sex, but by gender identity, there may be more acquired capability in um, many of the males if there's more involvement in um, some of these experiences. Now, we also have a lot of sexual trauma with girls, so it's not that easy to understand, but this notion of capability for physical injury, um, people also talk about with the male-female difference. And then the third one I'd mention is just that we definitely have more help seeking in our nation. We have more professional help seeking uh, among girls and women than among boys and men. So when in distress, uh, girls and women may be more likely to share that, to talk about that, and to seek help both informally and professionally. So we may have many males at risk out there who are at risk and very alone in that risk and not getting the help they need. In terms of um, females and the, it, it really relates, I guess, to what I just said, there are definitely more expressions of emotional distress. I think they probably do not just report suicidal thoughts more frequently, but perhaps experience them maybe be more likely we've shown with girls and women to have ruminative forms of depression. Um, not that males don't ever, but that it's more likely. So we do get more expressions of depression, of suicidal ideation, um, even thoughts of suicide, and definitely more sharing that and help seeking for it. How we, can, how we can address it, you know, this is one of the biggest challenges in the suicide prevention field, without question, is trying to reach and prevent male suicides. And we are all working to prevent female suicides too. But it's been very challenging. Many interventions that are developed, many treatments. I mentioned dialectical behavior therapy. As the only treatment for suicide risk that's been validated in at least two trials, that trial enrolled something like 96% girls. Um, most of our psychotherapies, uh, the trials have more girls and our clinics are treating more girls. Um, sometimes when we try outreach or we try surveys, we get more girls to complete them. I did a survey with um, parents and teens in the emergency department to see what they thought about screening for suicide risk. All, uh, the parents and teens all thought it was a good idea. The teens thought it was more important to screen for suicide risks than dating violence, depression, eating disorders, drug use, um, you name it. The parents thought it was more, you'll be happy I hope with this, they thought screening for drug use and suicide risk were the two big ones and that those two together were more important than the risk. But what I wanted to say about the males is that the mothers thought it was a better, significantly better idea to screen than the fathers. And it's almost like whatever we're trying, we, we have some barriers to cut through yet. One thing that we're doing in the field to try to address it that I think you could consider too, is where are the settings where the males are, where we could train the gatekeepers 
where we could do proactive screening. And that's when I moved my work from working in the psychiatric hospital where I developed the youth nominated support team and our outpatient clinics and move to working in emer medical emergency departments, not psychiatric emergency departments, medical ones. Boys and girls come in just as often. Not only that, it's slightly enriched for suicide risk because in addition to sports injuries and non-compliant diabetes, brittle diabetes, and exacerbations of chronic medical illnesses and influenza, you actually get uh, victims of physical violence, alcohol poisoning, single car accidents. Um, it's, um, it's enriched there, and it's a good place to screen young people or to have gatekeepers who are trained to recognize risk and to try to intervene. That's one of the key places now in the Surgeon's General Report and different recommendations coming out nationally where we can maybe risk uh, reach many of the um, boys and young men at risk. Thank you, that was a very comprehensive answer. Um, so one more question from Katka and then we'll start getting into the participant questions. Uh, you mentioned that means restriction counseling is rarely used and that many youth hospitalized for deliberate self-harm do not receive mental health services post-discharge. Um, how can community coalitions support these at-risk youth in getting the services that they need? Yeah, it's, I think one is to reduce stigma everywhere it appears in the community and um, have our radar out, our eyes out for stigma, um, it, reducing the barriers to help seeking. And I think there's different ways we do this. I think it's interesting for many young people, there's actually less stigma um, than certainly for my generation. Um, I think there is more of a willingness, at least when they're talking about their peers. But self-stigma can be powerful, where a young person thinks it's fine if their friends and others are going for help. They don't like it when they try it on for themselves. They don't like to see themselves as someone who's getting help. Uh, they're stigmatizing themselves. So the more we can work with families to try to have open conversations and make this okay. I think the other are the messages in our various agencies. You know, familiarity is liking in social psychology. Um, the more people can see messages, I think it reduces stigma. And also messages that um, help is available that there are some effective strategies that could make a difference. Um, it, you know, it's about reducing barriers. And some of this is people believing that the help will make a difference, um, having help that's affordable um, and nearby, um, having families that support them in it and communities so they don't feel different and stigmatized. I also think when it comes to suicide prevention and driving down the rate, we will have to do more with firearm safety in our country. Um, and I think we can do that. Uh, we're finding families are, are on board. Uh, one of the ways we're approaching it, which is interesting, is families with very young children and new babies and toddlers, because it's just a time when we, as parents, have this great readiness to uh, safety-proof our homes and just developing these habits very early on in families, I think can make a difference too. But it's not easy. Um, and I welcome your questions because some of this has to do with um, tailoring to your communities and what there are different kinds of suicide prevention strategies that could all make a difference, but it's where are there champions in your community who are in the position, have the, the will um, the time and energy and an interest in a particular strategy uh, and can bring a coalition together to implement that strategy. So I don't think it's a matter of rank ordering them, which is the best uh, and the second and the third best. It's what would work now in your community where someone in a group has a will to move it forward. 
Okay, so we're going to start with some questions from participants. Um, there's a couple of questions about just a few kind of clarifying questions. So first, suicide is the second leading cause of death among adolescents. Uh, someone wants to know which is the first leading cause. Yeah, so let's, um, let's just go back one and I'm gonna kind of emphasize this. So the first leading, oh, this one did not have all forms of accidents. It only had traffic fatalities. Um, but the first leading cause is um, uh, unintentional injury, which includes traffic fatalities. So here, traffic itself just went below suicide on this graph. I, are we still um, uh, screen sharing, Carolina? Yeah, talking? we are. That's something they can <laughs> Okay. Um, but when you combine traffic fatalities with other uh, unintentional injuries like drowning, um, um, unintentional poisoning, uh, or drug overdose, that is the most common cause. And then homicide is third. Okay, and then the second question to clarify is, uh, in the very beginning, you had a couple graphs that had um, different racial groups on them and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. two participants noted that Latinos were not uh, listed separately uh, and one, someone wanted to know if they're part of the white group or how are they accounted for in this? Yeah, they're not on this one. Um, it's interesting and um, the federal government, you know, kind of separates race and ethnicity. Um, but Latinos generally, um, Whereas the majority identify as white, some identify as black, some identify as American Indian. And the way we ask the questions, it's a separate uh, category um, so that people are saying um, uh, Latino, Latina, yes, no, and indicating white, black, American Indian, Asian Pacific Islander. Some of our young people are reporting up to five categories. So it's just not on this particular um, graph um, because it's, you know, the way this comes from the CDC, they separate out and consider that ethnicity. I, I can't give you all the history of that, but I could say that the line is not gonna be exactly like any of these, uh, but because the majority will self-identify as white, it's gonna most closely map this. But you can also look separately by um, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, Latino, Latina, non. Uh, I don't have those graphs today though. Okay, and now we have a, a question uh, from Nara. Do we know how long after major trauma kids are at major risk of suicide? And how long should a community that has experienced major trauma, such as a school shooting, uh, work to prevent the suicide risk? And, or what are the signs that we can recognize that the kids may be at risk after an event, such as a yeah. school shooting? Yeah, I, I, uh, a school shooting is um, you know, a horrific tragedy for a community. It's not necessarily going to be associated with increased um, suicide risk. Now, it could be a risk factor in someone who has many other risk factors, but it's not the case that everyone who was present is now at elevated risk for suicide. The, um, the kinds of trauma that are going to be more associated are things like sexual and physical abuse. Now, obviously, if someone is present in the school shooting, that could, you know, in right there and experiencing that. So it's not that it's not a risk factor, but I wouldn't necessarily think that it's elevating the risk for the entire community. It might be worth though, I agree, looking for signs. What's interesting is that after these major traumas um, like this, or, or real catastrophes um, that go on in a, in a community where sometimes many people die, it does seem to hold over and over that, um, you know, something like about 80% of the people show this amazing resilience. And then you get this one fifth who are struggling. And so it may be that it's that one fifth 
if that combines with a lot of other risk factors. Um, let me give you a website um, that uh, I believe it's Youth Suicide Warning Signs, all written together, dot org. Now, maybe someone uh, can try that who's listening in case I have it wrong, but I think it's Youth Suicide Warning Signs, dot org. And uh, they brought a group of us together, SAMHSA, um, different suicide prevention organizations, researchers, clinicians, parents of youth who'd been suicidal to say, can we come up with a shorter list of warning signs that, because uh, so many of the lists were just very long. And I believe these are on this website um, and in different versions, um, you know, to share with different groups of people. But the idea, we landed with four, and I won't exactly have them memorized here, but one is certainly talking about, writing about suicide, um, you know, one is severe emotional pain, um, you know, just showing severe emotional pain, agitation, expressing hopelessness. And then the last one is you notice worrisome behavior. And we couldn't find another way to put that, but it's, it's a change for the person. Maybe they're withdrawing more. Maybe they're constantly arguing and agitated. Maybe they quit participating in all their usual activities. But you notice some worrisome behavior in the face of this emotional pain or hopelessness or talking about suicide. And that's some of what I would look, look for. Um, I also think if you go to some of the websites, the National Institute of Mental Health, or another one is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention which I believe is AFSP.org. There are many useful uh, handouts that uh, at both of these uh, with information about risk factors and warning signs uh, that, that you may appreciate. I also um, would like to share um, on the website, let me see if I can uh, get out of, can I get out of my slideshow easily? Let me see. I'm going to try to do this. Um, and just show you the page. Let's see if I can do this. Okay. Well, let's go to the end here where I share the website. I believe it's on my thank you slide. Um, if you go to this website, um, there's a link for suicide prevention resources on this site. And you could print these resources off. And what we've put there are the different hotlines, um, the, uh, some of the websites and the hotlines where someone could call them in a crisis and also where someone could go and get um, information. I'm getting a note that there's a microphone issue. Can you hear me? Uh, I can still hear you. Okay. Um, so I wrote down those websites you mentioned. I also want to share that someone put in the chat that the Jason Foundation uh, has a lot of training for, I think they mentioned uh, different adults that are working with uh, youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, educators, parents, and coaches. So uh, that's something that was suggested by one of the participants. Another participant mentioned that SAMHSA has something called CALM, which is Counseling on Access to Lethal Means. Um, so that's available, but I will send out all these links. I think one more thing, people had a lot of questions about different resources and different programs, which I don't think we have time to get to at the moment. Um, but I do want to ask you if you'd be able to share uh, more information about that program you mentioned in the Upper Peninsula about reducing lethal means and also about the family checkup program that you mentioned. You know, absolutely. With the family checkup, it did not certainly come out of our group. There have been many, many studies. So for that particular one, I've never implemented myself. I have just learned about it. 
I would suggest Googling it. <clears throat> I do believe it's being disseminated now, um, but I'm not an expert on the program per se. The one on the Upper Peninsula, we're doing a mini evaluation now. I do think of it as a pilot, but we have 15 families with preschoolers, 15 families with um, early elementary, and 15 with adolescents. And they're gonna be just completing our follow-ups um, by uh, the second week in October. And then um, we're gonna pull it together and see what we learn. I of course, So it's a brand new uh, online intervention we just developed. I actually really like it. And I will go back with the team. We probably have to finish the follow-up and see you know, at what point I could get permission. Um, one reason I like it, it's not you know, beautiful um, as an online intervention, but it's so functional and um, what, what am I looking for? It's so reasonable. A lot of times I think what we're looking for with interventions, we're asking, we're asking people to sign up for too much and everyone's lives are, are, are busy and it's, it's a lot to manage and uh, especially with our families, with children and work and COVID uh, and worries and, and trying to be good parents that you know, we really need to offer them tools that, that can fit into that life. And this is what I like about it. I think you can um, go to it when you can and you can go back to it to finish when you want to. Uh, and it's very up to date. So I would be delighted actually to share it as soon as I uh, can get an okay from my, my team. I'm all about getting the materials out there. You know, I'm also a clinical scientist, but the idea we're ever gonna have all the answers from science or be done and ready to share, I think is a terrible disservice to our community. So I will share it as soon as I can and invite you to uh, use it yourselves or use it with the families you work with. Thanks to everyone who's been uh, putting various links in the chat or in the q and I'm trying to note them all down so we can distribute them to everyone following the webinar. Um, you were just mentioning COVID and there was one question if you can take a minute to answer it. Uh, where is that COVID question? I thought it would be timely to finish off on that. Ah, do you think that during this time in COVID-19 we'll uh, be finding an increase in adolescent suicide rates? Oh, I'm worried about that. Um, I'm very worried about that. I, I think that we may, I'll tell you what my fear is. Um, it, it's, um, it's the interpersonal trauma with, um, with everyone home together all the time. And uh, I think that that is really very stressful for some families and um, and in families where people maybe are struggling with conflict or coping with strong emotions. Um, so I do wonder about the uh, families that are isolated, um, the children who aren't going to school where they can sometimes speak up and, and share or have uh, adult supports that are outside of the family. Um, there's another side of it. I think for some of our young people, they're, it's much less stress. You know, we actually, um, in the summertime, our psychiatric hospital units for teens are not full. Uh, we have many fewer psychiatric emergencies with adolescents, at least many fewer adolescents who come in with psychiatric emergencies to our health systems nationwide in the summer. The, the hospitalization is also nationwide. And there is a, certainly uh, less stress for some youth with not being in the school environment. And yet the online environment can also um, nurture and breed a lot of uh, bullying of another form. So I don't have any real wisdom on this, but I, I, I worry that we may see an increase. All right, so we've 
already collected a lot of resources, so I won't ask that final question from Katka about resources. Um, but before we wrap up, can you go to the one slide previous to this? Um, yes. I want to let everyone know about the next webinar in this series. Um, so CADCA released the 12th Practical Theorist, Cannabis, the Current State of Affairs in early July, and we're going to discuss that publication in a special edition of this webinar series on October 1st. So Sue Thaw, the CADCA consultant, will join me in presenting on the latest cannabis research. More information is going to be sent out about this webinar in the coming weeks, uh, so please mark your calendars. Uh, final slide, please. Uh, October 7th, I see someone was asking in the chat. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm going to distribute the slides and also the link to Dr. King's article and the recording to everyone who participated um, following this webinar. I'm also going to distribute those links that we've been discussing. Um, that email will contain a short evaluation for this webinar, so please fill it out. And if you would like a letter of participation, once you fill out uh, the evaluation on the thank you page, you're going to see a link to view and download that letter of participation. So you must fill out an evaluation to get to the letter, and then you want to download it right after you fill out the evaluation because you won't be able to get back to that thank you page later in the day. Um, the recording and the resources mentioned in the presentation and in the Q&A session are going to be posted on the CADCA website. And finally, I just wish to thank Dr. King for the wonderful and comprehensive presentation on your work and for your commitment to providing current and relative material. And thank you to all the participants for your comments and your questions and your links to helpful resources. Thank you. Have a, have a good afternoon, everyone.